Um, so what I'm going to do is kind of talk a little bit about the nuts and bolts about what gender and security means and why it, gender perspectives matter and uh, talk very briefly about this, the frameworks that we have and, and then a little bit about my work and experiences on the ground. Uh, here we go. Um, and I have a little bit of a PowerPoint, uh, which I'll try to move through uh, quickly. So, um, you know, the, the first thing that we talk about or we need to think about when we're talking about gender and security and um, you know, you're talking about citizen security and, and the broader human concept is is what is conflict and I'm not sure if you covered some of this um, earlier today um, but you know thinking about the fact that conflict has changed and it's no longer just about um, you know state security and borders you know we've really seen a rise in um, intra-ethnic tensions and a uh, conflict over natural resources and um, ethnic and religious identities um, and of course you know we've seen really systematic acts of violence against civilian populations and not, it's not that civilians haven't been killed um, in wars throughout history, but, you know, really those you know, targeted attacks using civilians, um, you know, systematically is really what we're seeing these days. And 90% of casualties of war are civilians, and of that, 70% are women and children. So it's no longer, obviously, just, um, you know, mainly soldiers dying on the field. It's the broader population that's being affected. Um, of course, we see, you know, the new tactics of war, things like, um, you know, sexual violence, of uh, going beyond just kind of the, you know, rape has been a part of war for, um, you know, throughout centuries. It's not something new, but the kind of, again, really targeted um, sexual violence that's meant to really destroy communities and use as for things like genocide and ethnic cleansing. Um, we're seeing a lot more of um, abduction for fighting, abduction for sexual slavery, um, things like forced displacement. So again, really going beyond fighting among soldiers and, and really affecting the population and using the population um, in the conflict. So, you know, looking at what is security, it sounds like you've, you've talked a little bit about this too, and then we'll be thinking about it throughout the seminar. Um, and, you know, we, we talk in terms of human security or citizen security, uh, which is freedom from fear and freedom from want. So again, looking beyond just the state and looking at people, because if people are not secure, the states really cannot be secure. Um, where there's poverty, where there's oppression, where there's marginalization, you know, we see that there are um, power vacuums. Um, I know uh, Doreen is going to talk a little bit um, uh, more in detail about some of the terrorist organizations that are operating in Africa. But we've really seen that, uh, you know, they, they come in and operate um, in the absence sometimes of, of government, government services, and are really, uh, you know, preying on people's vulnerabilities. So we need to look at things like job security, um, economic security, health, um, you know, personal security, um, environmental security. We've seen a lot of environmental disasters now displace entire populations, which then make them more vulnerable to other abuses, and especially women and children who are displaced are, um, you know, often... Uh, victims of uh, sexual and gender-based violence. So it's really looking at the whole picture and making sure that people are secure in their own lives. Um, and just to briefly show that, you know, the UN has made the link between security and development, um, linking development, human rights, and security. Um, under the human security approach is kind of a triangulated approach. And it's really people-centered. Um, comprehensive prevention-oriented responses that strengthen the protection and empowerment of all people. And again, it's really looking towards people and the responses. And so effective security operations really um, need to establish safe and secure environments that are conducive to economic development and education and health care and the growth of vibrant civil society, which, as I'll discuss in a few minutes, is really important when we're talking about security. And these goals can only be met if men and women uh, are equally involved in shaping policies and programs, which is one of the other elements of uh, gender and security. So you might hear the term gender lens. We often talk about you know, putting on a gender lens, looking through a gender lens. And so what does that really mean? It's basically what it sounds like. You're looking at everything from a gender perspective. Um, and we start with basic gender analysis. So these are the kinds of things we're looking at when we're looking at societies and gender relations within societies. Things like access to resources, 
Um, you know, who can own land? Who can get loans from the bank? Is it just limited to men? Can women do it too? Do they need permission from their husbands or from their fathers to, to get loans or to hold assets? Um, what are the knowledge, beliefs, and perceptions in society? Um, so, you know, what are those gender roles? What is expected of men? What is expected of women? Uh, you know, is it the men that go out and work, the women stay home? What are their different roles? Um, practices and participation. You know, who's allowed to participate in public life? Who can run for office? Who can vote? Who can get out and organize? Who can be on the streets? Um, legal rights and status, of course, are very important. Um, you know, are, are the laws um, discriminatory? Are they allowing um, equal access? And really, all of these things, what we're looking at is power, because it's those power structures that really um, affect not only relations, but the security of people. So when we're looking at gender analysis for conflict and peace, again, we're looking at the different roles and controls of resources and really at those power structures. And we're looking at the gender natures um, of the causes of war and the perceptions of causes. And really importantly, the different security risks and needs of men and women and boys and girls because they might be different, right? So, um, you know, often it's men who are recruited as um, soldiers or who are targeted with certain messages about being men, about standing up for their religion or their tribe or their identity, right? And women uh, might be targeted um, with different messages, right? So to support the men, um, to be good wives, to join the movement, or often, you know, they're forced to do so. So really looking at, um, you know, what's, what's the situation of the people on the ground? So we talk about inclusive security, um, which is really, again, what it sounds like, including everybody in security. And why is it important to include the gender perspective? Again, looking at gender as social constructions, right? So sex is man, woman, right? Your biological sex. Gender is how society ascribes these values. How is a man supposed to act? How is a woman supposed to act? What are their different roles? Um, how conflict affects men, women, boys, and girls differently. Um, and again, how the gender relations and power um, inequalities often fuel insecurity. And we talk about gender mainstreaming, which is considering all of these and everything that we do um, for better outcomes. And why is specifically including women matters? It's again, it's because it's about bringing all the voices to the table that can find uh, real pathways to security and sustainable peace. And I have you know, a little puzzle there because really, you know, if we look at it traditionally as just bringing the warring parties together, we're not going to get to the root causes, which is really, you know, what we're, we're talking about when we're talking about human security is getting to those root causes of conflict. Again, you know, are, is it because people are being marginalized, different groups have felt like they've been um, oppressed or kept out of political power, or they're being um, persecuted because of their religious beliefs? Right? Or is it because of people being displaced because of environmental disasters or because of poverty? So looking at what's really causing the conflicts and then how to address those issues. And then it's really important to uh, look at women as agents of change and not just victims. And you often hear people talk about, and I'll mention, you know, instances where, um, you know, gender-based violence is obviously a, a huge issue in conflict today. And I was talking about the, the sexual violence. And that all is, is critical and it's really important to address those issues. But also really important to understand that, that, that women have agency, that women, um, you know, as a part of communities really have a lot to say about how to address these problems and they can really help us to transform societies and cultures and they're not just victims, so they need to be at the table. Um, so just briefly, you know, we're looking, when we're looking at um, gender and security and conflict, we need to look at what be happens before, during and after conflict. Um, you know, early warning indicators, again, going into those root causes and uh, issues of human security. We often see things like intergroup tensions, uh, localized conflicts, things like growing poverty. Um, people have reduced access to food and safe water. Um, lack of basic state services, as I said, you know, often um, there's instability or, or a lot of the terrorist groups come in where is there is that vacuum that's being left by the government. Lack of um, 
job opportunities, uh, militarization of society. So all these things, again, uh, you know, looking at, at human security. Um, and increased insecurity of, of women is uh, a really important indicator. Um, you know, often where we see um, instability in different areas, when there's an increase in gender-based violence, that is an, um, often an early warning indicator of conflict. And then during conflict, um, you know, of course, we see um, gender-based violence. Uh, we also see, um, you know, women as participants in fighting. Um, we th see things like denial of property and land rights and displacement in humanitarian settings, um, which, you know, uh, all, all of the population is often affected by these things, you know, both men and women. But again, um, you know, looking at the specific needs um, and especially in things like displacement and humanitarian settings, we see that women and children uh, become much more vulnerable. And then after conflict, again, um, looking at all of society, reintegration of combatants into society, um, the psychosocial, psychosocial effects of trauma, and returning from displacement, um, and you know what's the economic opportunity. But when we are looking at gender insecurity, one of the biggest things um, is the change gender roles. Uh, so oftentimes, you know, and, and of course we've seen this in, in this, this country during the World Wars, um, you know, the men go off to fight and women who, uh, you know, maybe at that time have not been in the workplace uh, need to support their families. Um, so they go to work or maybe they become part of the war um, effort in, in factories and manufacturing. And then the men come home and, you know, these roles have changed. So whereas it was typical that the women stayed home, they were now the breadwinners and, you know, if the, the, the men come back um, and don't, you know, are, are dealing with trauma and, you know, maybe have lost their jobs, don't have opportunities, um, you know, they're, then they're, you know, that can also exacerbate um, already existing tensions in society as they're trying to deal with these, these changed roles. And then we see things like um, alcoholism, again, increases in things like gender-based violence. Um, women are a very powerful force for peace, and one of the reasons why we need to make sure everybody's at the table, including women. Um, they've been very active in conflict prevention and building bridges. Um, we see uh, in Africa, uh, some examples. I don't know if anybody's here seen here has seen the um, the documentary "Pray the Devil Back to Hell." It's about uh, Liberia. I see a couple couple of nods, and I highly recommend it. Um, I often show it when I have more time. It's uh, the wonderful story of women in Liberia, um, uh, led by Lema Gwobi, who came together across religious divides and really put pressure on uh, the government and the rebels there back in I guess. 2002, um, to really get to peace talks. You know, they were, uh, they, um, you know, went to the market every day and, you know, wore white shirts and danced and sang and, you know, made sure they were there when the president went by and really, you know, put public pressure. And, uh, you know, even when the, the parties were in peace talks in, uh, I believe it was Ghana, after, uh, you know, two or three weeks not really getting anything done, you see them kind of loafing around in the documentary, the women actually encircled the room that they were in and said, you are not coming out until you start, until you start negotiating. And Lema even, she threatened to take off her clothes because that's a, you know, big, uh, big superstitious no-no. Um, so she actually got people to the table. Uh, so, you know, just really, then there's so many of those stories, um, you know, throughout Africa and, and really across, across the world. Um, understanding community needs and addressing root causes. Again, you know, if we just have the warring parties at the table, usually they're going to be concerned with, you know, first putting down their arms and what happens with the arms and then who's going to have what power, right? So who's going to control the government? Um, you know, who's going to have uh, ministry positions? But then when we get other groups there, you know, when we get women, when we get, uh, you know, other minority groups, when we get um, people from civil society, they're not just thinking about power, they're thinking about what's actually going on in there communities and why the conflict has happened and so how you know how to really address that um, in peace and uh, combating extremism uh, you know women play a very important role um, you know often as mothers who um, you know see what's happening in their families you know if they're they've um, 
there's a, a story here a few years ago in uh, Virginia about a woman who uh, noticed that her son was spending all kinds of hours on the internet and, and going out at odd times and she started snooping around and found out that he um, he had been looking at uh, you know ISIS online recruitment and thinking about going to Syria um, and you know she was able to you know talk with him and you know really prevent that from happening um, and it, uh, you know we see instances in, in so many communities uh, both here and in other countries where um, you know just being aware of what's happening in families and communities which um, it's not to say that that um, you know men aren't a part of that but women um, because of their roles, often have kind of that inside information and insight as to what's going on. Um, and we often talk about, you know, increasing operational effectiveness when it comes to security sector. Um, so affecting institutional change from the inside, um, you know, especially when we're talking about security, it's, you know, often a very kind of um, hard traditional field um, that often, you know, usually perpetuates um, kind of the, the, the harsh masculinities and discrimination. So being on the inside and be able to change people's perceptions um, and to de-escalate tensions in the use of excessive, ex excuse me, excessive force, um, improving responses to gender-based violence. Um, so often it's, it's necessary to have women involved when you're dealing uh, um, with female victims of gender-based violence to have that sensitivity, um, but also just to, for, to have the broader sensitivity. Um, gaining the trust of local communities. Um, in many places we've seen that um, local communities will trust uh, women, um, women soldiers who have come in from other countries more than men. Um, and, you know, looking at closed cultures, a lot of times men and women have to be separated. So, um, you know, if there are, are checkpoints or if you're working in communities where you need to check in with the women and, and what's happening. And again, you know, they often have information about what's happening in, in the communities and the needs. You know, if, if um, people are gathering and stockpiling arms and things like that, it's very useful to have um, you know, women who can go in and, and talk to them and relate to them. And just very briefly, um, to look at the kind of policy frameworks that we have, uh, we have UN Security Council Res Resolution 1325, which um, was initially uh, passed by the Security Council in 2000, um, and was the result of advocacy by women's groups from around the world in conflict-affected countries um, to really recognize uh, not only the effects, the different effects of conflict on w women and girls and girls and boys, but again, the, again, the, the really, um, you know, how critical it is to have gender perspectives and have women at the table in all peace processes. Um, so it calls on all parties at all times to respect international law. Um, and it's really, its aim is to increase the role of women in conflict prevention, management, and post-conflict reconstruction, and to promote inclusive development, peace, and security. And it has four pillars. Um, which is very briefly uh, participation, so making sure that women and men have equal opportunities to participate, whether it's in the peace processes, negotiations, um, governments, the you know security, judicial sectors, really in um, everything. And protection again, you know, I was mentioning that we see often in displacement settings and humanitarian settings, um, refugee camps, um, internally displaced person camps. There is a lot of gender-based violence, unfortunately, often perpetrated by uh, by the military and police. People who are actually supposed to be protecting uh, the people in these camps. Um, so, making sure that gender perspectives are taken into account. You know, are these camps being um, situated so that, uh, you know, women don't have to, um, you know, walk far to go to the bathroom in the dark um, where they might be in danger and having training and having zero tolerance policies. Um, prevention, which I think, you know, is really a, a critical pillar that we don't usually, we're kind of responding after the fact, but preventing these things from happening is really important. So having systems in place, having laws in place, having policies um, that will prevent um, human rights abuses and, and discrimination and violence. And then gender mainstreaming is really, again, putting on that gender lens into everything we do. And we do have the U.S. National Action Plan on Women, Peace, and Security, um, which kind of takes 1325 and, um, you know, talks about how to implement it 
uh, throughout the U.S. government, and I don't know if um, people here are, are familiar with the with the National Action Plan, um, but it has the five pillars, which is national integration and institu institutionalization of gender responsive approach. So again, you know, integrating gender. Um, perspectives into all of the agencies, uh, participation, participation, protection, uh, prevention, the same as in 1325, um, and also access to relief and recovery. So making sure that, um, you know, women equally as men have access to resources after conflict. Um, and that's the PowerPoint presentation. So I, let me just, I'm probably going over my time. Um, I'll just uh, speak for a few minutes um, on kind of how to implement these things. And like I said, um, you know, to me it's really about changing the paradigm of how we think about security, um, you know, to human security uh, and thinking broadly beyond the kind of traditional actors, right? So we definitely, you know, we need to include um, governments and the security sector and the justice sector, but it's also very critical to engage civil society. Um, and traditional and social and cultural leaders. Um, and it's also very critical to engage men, and it's nice to see that there are um, a lot of men in this room because uh, often when it's, you know, something specifically gender-related, it tends to be very women-heavy. But um, it's important to engage men on these issues. One, because, you know, it, I was talking about the um, power structures and so if we really want to change things, we need men on board because they're generally the ones in power. But also looking at um, what we call masculinities, which has become very important in the field in recent years. So how, how men are socialized, you know, what does it mean to be a man, right? And to be, to be tough and to fight. And, you know, also that men are often victims of violence themselves. So how does that play in um, to how men and women are relating to each other? Um, and, you know, of course, some of the, you know, the, the biggest barriers are often um, societal and cultural because we're often operating in contexts where um, the societies are traditional and they have traditional roles um, and they might not, uh, you know, look at human rights issues and they certain don't, certainly don't have gender equality. And so that's where we really, you know, we can have all the laws and policies in place that we want, but unless we're really working with the institutions and the people and the, um, you know, cultures that have been perpetual, perpetuating this discrimination, we're not really going to be able to make change. Um, and I'll just give a, a few quick examples um, from my work in the Africa region. Um, I was doing some work in uh, Gula, Uganda, um, which of course has suffered conflict for, for many, many years. And um, the Kirikwa Choli, the traditional religious leaders there, have really been instrumental um, in uh, advancing peace and also gender equality. And I was sitting down with the leader and I said, you know, what, um, you know, what's kind of the, the, the key here? Because like, we get that question all the time. Like, what's, is, is there, a, is, is um, you know, is there a, kind of a magic answer as to how to um, engage, especially traditional cultures? And what he said to me is that after the conflict, um, you know, there, was, there were so many widows and there were so many issues um, with the women that they, it was really staring them in the face, so they had to really um, deal with them. And, and, and what's been really important, too, is, um, you know, finding ways that uh, really relate with the culture. So obviously a lot of times, you know, going in um, as international advocates, uh, you know, we can talk about these human rights principles, which are very important, but we have to put them in terms that the local cultures will understand. And for instance, um, the Uganda Supreme Muslim Council um, has worked with uh, local imams and, and religious leaders to actually put together materials um, that will, you know, look at the international human rights principles and look at their domestic laws, um, but then tie them to uh, provisions from the Quran, which obviously is a way um, that makes it much more relatable to their community, but is, you know, saying, you know, what, what, what Islam really says about human rights and how to treat women. Um, so it's really important to, to work in that in cultural context and to find the, um, you know, the, the, the leaders that are, will be kind of the gateways to communities. Um, and, uh, well, there's a lot to say, but I guess um, one of the last things I'll say is that, you know, it's, I think when you, when you talk about human rights and when you, especially when you talk about uh, women or gender, 
um, you often kind of get, well, you know, we'll deal with that later. First, we have to deal with the security issue. We have to deal with ISIS or we have to deal with Boko Haram or, you know, what, whatever the issue is in that country. Um, but it's really important for people to understand, again, that if we're not addressing these issues, we're not going to actually get to peace. Um, I was in um, Turkey a few months ago training Syrian human rights defenders um, how to advocate around sexual violence and conflict. And again, you know, people people often think, well, we'll deal with that later. We got we got to get, uh, you know, we we got to get um, ISIS out of there. We have to get the country stabilized. But it's part of accountability, right? So you have to have people need to be accountable for human rights abuses and for gender based violence because without that, you're just perpetuating a culture of impunity. Um, so uh, I guess I'll end there because I know I went over time and I will look forward to the questions and answer session. Thank you.